good afternoon. Welcome to this virtual launch event for the book Human Work in the Age of Smart Machines. It's the latest book by Lumina Foundation President and CEO Jamie Marisotis. My name is Dr. Kim Hunter-Reed and I'm looking forward to moderating our discussion. We'll be together for the next 60 minutes as we have conversations with Jamie and hear from others on how the work of the future is human work. And we'll reserve the last 15 minutes or so for questions and answers. We have a wonderful lineup for you today. First, we'll listen in on Jamie's conversations with two leading economists. They'll share their insights with us on human work from an economic perspective. Later, we'll hear Jamie's discussion with Francisco Marmolejo, one of the world's leading experts in higher education, who currently serves as education advisor with Qatar Foundation and previously led the team working on higher education issues at the World Bank. They'll chat about higher education's role in preparing people for human work and its role in supporting democracy on a global scale. We'll also hear a first person account from one of the nearly two dozen people, human workers, if you will, featured in Jamie's book, Marsha McCallum, who I think tells a story that you will find familiar about the experience of working mother and her journey of working and learning, which is very much a part of today's human work experience. Great to see you, Jamie. Congratulations on the book. Oh, thank you so much, Kim. I'm delighted to be here. Honestly, writing a book is like a journey. Sometimes it's a long journey. And uh, I'm happy to say that we've achieved this milestone of getting to the first point on the journey, which is getting the book out. There are many other points on the journey, of course, which is getting people to talk about the book, to act on the ideas, but I'm really thrilled to be here. And I wanna thank you so much for being a part of this. I'm really thrilled to be having this conversation with you and so many others that are interested in this topic of human work. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. And you know, when I reflect on your first book, uh, America Needs Talent, it was very public policy focused. This book, Human Work, focuses on big issues like work of the future and learning, earning and serving and revitalizing our democracy. I'm curious why focus on human work and work of the future at this point in time? Well, you know, I think you're right. Look, I've spent my life at the intersection of learning and work. The reality is that I've tried to understand how we are preparing people for work uh, through learning, through all of the work that I've done from my work in public policy to now for more than a decade at Lumina Foundation. I've really been motivated by this idea that we need to make post high school learning better, that we've got to produce more graduates from, from higher learning institutions. And of course, that we need to make sure that the learners reflect who we are as a society in terms of racial equity. But as people in education, you and I both know that increasingly we're being asked this question, Kim. And the question is, education for what? What are we preparing people for? And what I set out to do in this book is to try to answer that question by saying, look, we need to prepare people for human work, the work that only humans can do in this era of technology and technology mediated living and learning. The reality is that automation and AI are really changing how we work and live. And now COVID has really accelerated that process. Um, I've been reading these stories, these articles over the course of several years, and I've gone to all of these conferences around the so-called future of work. And too many of them after a while started to feel like what we were talking about was some sort of robot zombie apocalypse, that the robots were gonna come, they were gonna eat all of our jobs and that none of us would have anything to do. My view is that what we should be talking about is not the future of work, but the work of the future. This is the work that only humans can do because it underscores our human traits and our human characteristics. Those human traits are things like being empathetic, being able to actually um, be compassionate, to be ethical, to be able to uh, uh, be, be a, a collaborator, to be someone who can actually communicate with other people. So it's important for us as human workers to be able to develop and hone those human traits and human capabilities over the course of a lifetime. You know, at the end of the day, we as human workers, of course, we wanna make money. We wanna make money because it's important that we are able to contribute to our own well-being and to societal well-being. But human work, human workers are, are looking for more than that. Compared to the machines, the machines don't need to make money, but more importantly, human 
workers need meaning in what they do. They're looking for social mobility. And at the end of the day, they're looking for dignity. Human work, uh, therefore, is what distinguishes us from the machines, because for us as human workers, work matters. Yes, it does. Thank you, Jamie, for that. Uh, absolutely meaningful work is critical. I'd like to segue to your first fireside chat. It's a great one. Uh, you spoke earlier with Karen Kimbrough and Austin Goolsby on human work, capital markets, and human capital. Let's hear what they have to say about human work. Francisco, thank you very much for joining me. My pleasure, Jamie. Great seeing you. Thank you. So, you know, Francisco, we know that on a global scale, higher education contributes very much to exposing communities and people to diverse ideas and, and cultures. We know that uh, it shows that differences aren't nearly as important as people may think who don't have higher education. How do you think about higher education from your expert perspective and how human attributes, things like uh, being able to be empathetic, uh, being able to be uh, open and flexible, actually contributes to this idea of improving societies and people? Well, uh, you know, first of all, congratulations for the book, uh, Jim. It's, it's great uh, uh, that uh, you had the time to prepare this very interesting uh, uh, work that I'm sure that is going to be of uh, interest for a lot of people. Um, you know, they, they, it is uh, clear that uh, a, uh, education is the best investment that societies can make uh, for a variety of reasons. And mostly because, of course, prepares people with the right skills for, you know, the work, but more important because it prepares citizens for uh, society. And that requires precisely a combination of elements that are important. Now, uh, in higher education, we uh, have the tendency to think a lot about the need to prepare people with a number of skills that are going to be needed for the future, you know, uh, critical thinking, openness, flexibility, empathy, etc. Uh, but one point that is very important is to remember that it is in the entire educational system that not, that needs to be achieved. In fact, as you know very well, in a great number of those skills are acquired at an earlier age. So by the time students arrive in higher education, it is too late. Uh, they, uh, they need to be start preparing for that since they are in the previous levels of education. Now, if you translate that to society, so what that means? Well, you know, we live in societies which here are increasingly diverse. And uh, studies show very clearly that those who have the opportunity to enjoy education are the ones who have the tendency to become more tolerant, to become much more open to the ideas, to the otherness, I might say, to have the opportunity to take out your glasses and to put the glasses of the other in order to develop a sense of understanding of the issues, the realities, the concerns, the aspirations that the other people may have. And this is again and again, something that we need to be reinforcing in our educational systems. We are not preparing in our colleges and universities, people just for jobs. We are preparing people for life. And if we don't forget about, then we are going to be able to align more effectively our educational systems. I think that's right. And, you know, one of the things I point out in the book is that it makes you a critical thinker, a better problem solver, someone who can actually contribute both individually to your own life, but also to the well-being of, of society. And you know, I think there's many ways in which we as humans need to develop those capacities and skills. And, and would you agree, Francisco, that higher education is one of the most important pathways to doing that? It is one of the most important. In fact, it is the, the formal one we have. But at the same time, we should recognize that higher education needs to change, needs to go, get a little bit out of the ivory tower because you know it's the way we dissect knowledge in higher education not necessarily reflects the realities of the outside world. And we need to be humble in our higher education institutions in recognizing that we need to bring to the school, to the institution, those perspectives that are from outside. Now, that requires at the same time, Jamie, the, uh, the need for higher education institutions to become also more flexible in their behavior. You know, if they are 
making the point about the flexibility of the students, they need to become flexible by themselves. And certainly, you know, the different studies conducted all over the world, you know, the World Bank did a lot of that uh, when I was working there, you know, shows that they, uh, again, the, the, the economic benefits, the social benefits of having higher education are fundamental for a better society. But it is needed for sure that higher education institutions, especially we, some of the things that we have learned during the crisis is that higher education institutions need to become much more open to society, much more open to the realities of the complex world. And that needs to be translated into something very concrete, which is named curriculum. If the curriculum doesn't sort of uh, accept those elements in the preparation of the students, it's going to be very difficult to translate that into uh, the mind, the mindset of the students. And one of the things that we know and you know from from your research is that education helps to thwart authoritarian attitudes, right? That one of the things about education is that it helps people understand democracy and pluralism. Uh, part of my research for the book showed that um, uh, Americans who have a high school credential or less, one third of them say that sit, having a strong leader is good for the country compared to 13% of people with college degree. In other words, having more education actually makes you more interested, more supportive of democratic systems and values. So how do we think about this, Francisco, when it comes to the intersection of education and human work? How do we ensure that education and the work that happens in education leading to human work can actually contribute to, to democracy? Well, you know, again, as you mentioned uh, very well, you know, research shows that people with higher education are much, much more open, much more willing to participate in civic life and uh, much more willing to value democracy. That's that's a fact. That's a fact. Now, uh, of course, uh, you know, the, the, the challenge uh, in how do we do that, uh, it represents significant um, uh, concerns on the way that educational systems work. Why? Because we need to develop much more, um, you know, a, a quality of opportunities, I might say, in order for more people to enjoy the benefits of education and more specifically, uh, the benefits of higher education. So if we know that people with higher education, we are going to be much more, uh, again, tolerant, more open, flexible, and of course, valuing democracy. How do we make sure that more people will have that opportunity? And certainly, many times our institutions with the idea that equating quality with selectivity uh, they become the, the the worst enemies i might say of this uh, I, of this intention of having much more people enjoying education and again one element is to provide more equitable access to education higher education and that means a lot of things that institutions can do and the second thing is how do we make sure that students have a valuable experience? I, that's what I refer to as this uh, virtuous triangle of higher education. We need to make sure that more people go to education, that more people uh, stay in education, that we reduce as much as possible the dropouts, that they have a relevant educational experience, and of course, that they graduate on time. If we achieve that, we are going to be making our higher education systems much more efficient and much more responsive to those needs of society. I think uh, we need to do a lot of work on that. I think the reflections that you are sharing in our book are going to be important for people uh, in education to think about ways in which we need to realign our educational institutions towards this new reality. I think, uh, you know, the crisis that we are still struggling with in the world with the pandemic it is um, exposing many of those inadequacies of our educational systems, but also is giving us the greatest opportunity that we ever had to challenge our assumptions about what is good and what is bad in higher education. And not always good means selectivity and quality. Good to me always means relevance. And relevance means precisely connecting more effectively to the human world. And one of the things about the pandemic that I think has really been revealed is that people have lost opportunities. They've lost the opportunity to work and in losing the opportunity to work, they've lost hope. 
Uh, people are really looking for meaning. They are looking for, for something that makes them optimistic. Tell me a little bit from your perspective. You've lived around the world. You've focused on these issues from a global perspective. How do we think about creating greater meaning, creating greater opportunity, creating greater success for individuals in society through human work? Well, you know, that's that's a that's a question in which, of course, there is too much to do. One thing that I will suggest is read the book of Jamie, because you provide in your book a lot of interesting hints uh, about, uh, you know, what, what I like of your book is the fact that you connect the reflections of your analysis to real people. And I think if we connect education to the needs, the aspirations, the challenges of real people, we are going to be able to take away from our higher education institutions many things that are not needed. That's why this is the greatest opportunity that we have to uh, sort of redesign, reimagine our educational institutions. If we do that, we are going to be able to connect more to the needs of the people and consequently to the opportunities for a better society. Francisco, thank you so much for joining me. It's my pleasure. Jamie, that was a great conversation with Francisco. We'll get to the economist later in the program, but you know, I really appreciate his perspective, global perspective. Uh, you too have a global perspective. It's certainly reflected in the book. Uh, so I wanna ask you a two-part question, if you will. First, can you share with us, uh, knowing that you were in the UK on sabbatical working on the book, how did that impact your thinking about uh, scaling what works and national perspective, national agendas? And then I know you brought your two children with you. So I'm curious as a parent, thinking about this fourth industrial revolution, how does that shape what your expectations are for your kids, for kids in America around education and experience? Kim, first of all, we were chuckling on this side about the wrong video being shown because we said, that's it. That's why we need human workers because the technology is <laughs> not going to do it for us. So that that proves the point more than anything else. But, but you're right. This conversation I had earlier with Francisco where we were really talking about this issue of the global perspective and, and what can be learned. I went through that with my family when last year I was able to take uh, six months, the entire family spent time in London we lived and 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 uh, spent time in London. The, the kids went to school. Uh, they played for an English uh, football club. It was a rich cultural experience. And part of what London did was it changed the point of view. It gave me and my family a different vantage point. It allowed us to actually be connected in a different way to people and ideas and a place that were very, very different. And so by being in arguably what is the most globally interconnected city in the world, you know, I think I came to fully appreciate the rapid advances in technology and what's really happening as a result of how technology is changing how we live and work. And you know, at the end of the day, um, I concluded that uh, this global experience gave me a sense of what's possible about what could change as a result of human work. And for my family, what I think my family learned and what we are learning now uh, back in the US going through the COVID environment, the remote learning environment, is that you've got to balance the learning and the other parts of your life in ways that actually help you be better prepared for work and for what the rest of life is all about. So, you know, it was a, it was a wonderful experience um, as we think about building a national agenda, national policy now here in the United States for human work, for being able to build an agenda for that work that only humans can do. Um, I think that perspective of understanding what's happening in the rest of the world was really gratifying and rewarding. That's fantastic. You know, one of the things that uh, I know from your perspective and, and from mine in terms of our careers, one of the things that we have always advocated for was of learning, but also for learners, being advocates, champions for learners. And I love that even Francisco referenced your book talks about learners, a learner narrative, but you go beyond just earning and learning and you talk about service, meaningful work, relevant work. Tell me a little bit more about why that is the new paradigm for you. 
you know, for me, this idea of learning, earning, and serving really is what human work is all about. And so serving, I think, is the part of, of this process that I think is really important that people need to better understand. Uh, we understand that we learn, uh, that learning is an important part of our life, and we understand that we need to earn. In other words, there is a learning part of life, and there's an earning part of life. But what we've come to recognize now is that these are not separate spheres. You don't learn earlier and then earn later. In fact, you learn and you earn over the course of an entire lifetime. But as I said before, what makes us uniquely human is that for us, work matters. And a key part of that is that we have to serve others as part of what we do. In fact, Gallup surveys show that for workers, workers are willing to give up money for meaning even the lowest income workers are saying that serving others, having dignity and purpose and meaning in what they do for work is really important to them as human workers. So there can't be this learning phase, this earning phase and this working phase. We actually have to think about who we are impacting through our, through our work. Well, how do we do that? How do we actually practically do that? Well, we can do that by thinking about how we do service integrated work or service learning, or bringing together these concepts of learning and earning and serving in ways that we haven't thought about before. So from an employer perspective, from an educator perspective, and of course, from a worker perspective, we need to be thinking about human work, not just as earning a paycheck and learning as you go, but the totality of learning and earning and serving others. That's what makes us unique as human workers. That's fantastic. I wonder if we could take a few minutes now to listen to Marsha McCallum's learning and earning journey. I actually started back to college after being out of academic lifestyle or being out of the academics for 30 years. When I decided to go back to school, I was a full-time waitress. I started doing this when my daughter and my son graduated from college. And I thought, well, if I can wait tables to get them through school, then maybe I can wait tables to get myself through school. Going back to school at my age was scary. There were times when I didn't know if I had it in me um, to finish my classes and try to take care of a home and try to work full time. Taking that first class was hard but my children were very supportive of me doing this and going back. They were instrumental in that little push to finish that application <laughs> and to actually start some classes. I started taking all the prerequisites for the nursing program and I took microbiology. <laughs> that is when I realized that's where I needed to be. I needed to be in a lab, I needed to be discovering things, I needed to being in the sciences. I started taking classes in the biotechnology program here at ACC. It was not the easiest thing to do. I don't have a science background, but my passion for the subject was just, it was just filled. It made me feel filled. And I never a million years would have thought I would ended up in the sciences, but here I am. When I first started working here at the ACC Bioscience Incubator, I learned so much from how to set up a lab that it brought out a lot of the critical thinking skills that I actually learned in class. I have learned more from making mistakes in the lab <laughs> than I have from doing the experiment right the first time and then um, just saying, well, that's the way it worked. Going in with the right mindset that I can learn from the failure, um, that made science actually even more exciting. I graduated from ACC um, in August with my first associates and I will be graduating in December with my second associates. Somebody had asked me before, how does it feel when I got that first degree and I couldn't put it into words. I, tell you, I actually told him, I was like, it's a feeling that I, I want to start dancing and then my, I get this little warm feeling here and it stops right at my heart and I just want to go, I did it! <laughs> I still, I, I, sometimes when I say it, I can't believe that I get to say those words. I graduated and I have a job. And not only do I have a job, I have a career in what I wanted to do from the very beginning of starting this program. 
I see the fruits of all those classes and all those labs and all those papers and all that studying and now I get to live it. I just love her joy in, in that accomplishment. The I did it, Jamie, just such a powerful narrative. And this is why we do what we do, right? This is this rewarding, uh, purposeful work that allows us to see people reach their full potential. In your book, you talk a lot about individual human workers. You elevate their stories. So important. Tell me why that was important to you. Yeah, you know, I think at the end of the day, absolutely right. Marsha's story is wonderful, as are the stories of the nearly two dozen other people who I was able to feature in the book, because at the end of the day, human work isn't a concept. It's real. It's happening right now. So these are real human workers. This is not some sort of forward looking uh, idea. This is an idea that's happening with real workers now. So you can uh, see in the book a whole range of different people who are going through this human work experience. Um, I feature a Syrian refugee in Toronto who's a musician who's teaching and a team of human workers at an organization in San Francisco that works to prevent child abuse and actually improve the lives of the people impacted by child abuse. Um, I talk and feature in a couple of different points in the book uh, to a president of a historically black college and university in Texas. He tells both his own story as a human worker and the impact that he's had on other people. In other words, people who have gone to the college who've developed their own human work skills. And I talked to an assembly line worker in Indiana, someone who started out on an assembly line putting pistons into Dodge Ram pickup truck engines, and today works on the line with the robots who are his colleagues. They literally call them collaborative robots, cobots. Um, all of these people, their stories, they put a human face on human work and they show that it reflects a wide array of work experiences and abilities. That wide array of work experiences and abilities is why human work is so important to develop and to deploy in society today. Human work is not something that's happening at some point down the road, it's happening today. But in order to be able to accelerate progress and to deal with the changes that we're seeing as a result of automation and AI, we have to do a better job of proactively preparing these human workers of the future. That's fantastic. You know, I, I wonder, did you have a favorite story as you were talking about elevating these stories? Was there one that really, really rang true for you? You know, there are so many good stories and I want people to make sure that they read the stories and sort of in the voice of the people who are there. But I really was struck uh, in particular about this story. His name is Joel Lewis. And he's the person that I mentioned who works at Cummins Engine in Columbus, Indiana. And his journey of going from someone who had worked uh, with his hands and then developed the knowledge and now works uh, to actually uh, uh, build these pickup truck engines, but is also working as a collaborator with the robots. I think it's a reflection of this idea that human work represents a totality of things. It's not just learning. It's not just earning. It's this combination of things, the learning and the earning and the giving back, the serving that I think is so important. And Joel's story, um, I think, is reflective of how much the world of human work uh, really is going to be different for us going forward. That's great. So the first fireside chat, I want to make sure we do have an opportunity to, to hear from the economist that you spoke with on human work and capital markets and human capital. So let's hear what they have to say about human work. Austin, Karen, thank you very much for joining me. I'm delighted you're with me. Honestly, I think I could probably just say human work, discuss, and the two of you could probably talk for, for many minutes, but maybe I'll get us started with a, with a question. Uh, and, and that's simply... Given what you know, you both know about the relationship between capital markets and human capital, how should we be thinking about human work both now and in the future? Karen, maybe we could start with you. Sure. So um, 
you know, thinking about capital markets, you know, a couple things come to mind. One is just maybe capital markets policy. The Federal Reserve um, has recently started to, I think, um, pay more attention to what full employment can mean in terms of an inclusive workplace, um, bringing everybody on board in an economic cycle so they can enjoy um, the gains, which often for less skilled people, people with less access to opportunity, those gains come later in the economic cycle. So I think the Fed has rightfully um, kind of decided to sort of tilt into um, a place where they're going to be more accommodative of reaching full employment and letting that run so those benefits can be realized by everyone. So that's one thing, that's policy. And then maybe the second area I would just quickly highlight, uh, Jamie, is this idea of the wealth gap um, and the income gap, the wealth gap, however you want to think about it, even the skills gap. Um, we know that prosperity coming from capital markets is best when every member of the society can enjoy it and partake. But right now we know that these gaps exist and you know the most recent data kind of suggests that the median wealth gap for uh, whites and Asians versus blacks and Hispanics is like five times. So five times as much wealth just sitting in um, certain families based on race. And I think the question is, how do we use capital markets to kind of close those gaps? And I think one of them is making sure people have access to capital that's fairer for fairer lending. But I think it also has to do with letting people get access to education and training that doesn't indebt them for two decades to come, because that's, that's essentially a barrier to entry for them. So I would think a lot about access um, to capital and also around policy. And Karen, given what you just said about uh, racial injustice, uh, I've been saying over the last uh, several months that I think both COVID and the reckoning around racial injustice has probably accelerated this pattern, this trend towards the impact of human capital on, on capital markets. Is that right? Am I right about that? You are right. It is, it's exacerbating a lot of the gaps that we're seeing. Um, and it's, it's um, I knew it would expose the gaps. I did not realize how much COVID would actually exacerbate them. Um, so the data are indeed showing that these gaps are widening, both in terms of employment, the, with the data that has just come out recently, but also in terms of just wealth and, and income and wage gaps. Well, thank you. So Austin, what's your cut on this issue of capital markets and human capital? I guess part of me, the, the economist part of me, um, wants to take a step back and, and ask the what's the broader forces at work. And it's always been a race between skills and technology for human capital and for what happens to wages, what happens to job and the and to jobs and the relationship of uh, of the capital markets with the with the human capital markets. And we've gotten into a period for the first half of the 20th century, the United States educational attainment was rapidly growing. A, we were leading the world in it. B, we were objectively increasing quite dramatically up through kind of the mid 1970s into the 1980s. E each generation dramatically increasing the share, getting a college degree or getting some, some kind of credential e equivalent. Right. That stalls out. And I don't think it's a coincidence that it stalls out at exactly the kind of moment that inequality begins to rise. And if we are to face massive technological changes, if that is to speed up, then to me, it puts the onus that much more on the skills side of the race, because you know the technology is, is constantly advancing. So you've got to keep this, the skill base of the workforce up. Otherwise, you're going to see the kinds of things that we've seen, the large sections of the, of the workforce losing jobs, getting into occupations and onto islands that they kind of can't get off of with stagnant incomes and exactly the kind of, of gaps, both racial gaps, geographic gaps um, that we've seen develop and get bigger, they're just going to get worse. So I, I think that it could not be more important to, to focus on that. So Austin, Karen mentioned this issue of prosperity and, and, you know, I like to think about prosperity broadly as both economic and social prosperity. You know, how should we be thinking about human work in the book? I say human work is the work that only humans can do. How should we be, we be thinking about human work 
and broader economic and social prosperity. And again, particularly given what we've seen in this year like no other in 2020. Look, in a way, I have a PhD in economics. I mean, you're asking me philosophical questions about society. I don't know that I have the the answer to that. Um, I guess the I always say the central question of economics is compared to what, and I feel that way about human work too. It's like it's the the work that only humans can do compared to what you know, and at what price. I guess I would uh, say there is an optimistic story which uh, most of the economists look at the last 150 years and they say there has been an unbelievable amount of labor replacing technology. If you just take a step back in manufacturing and services all across the economy, there's been a massive amount of replacement, but the unemployment rate did not go to 100%. And so we feel pretty confident that we will be able to keep inventing new stuff and moving into those new things. And I guess the example I'll give you is if you go back to 1979 and you look at Silicon Valley and you look at Detroit, they both were making things that nobody buys anymore. Okay. In Silicon Valley, they were mostly making computer hardware, which is now considered very low end stuff that's that's made in very low income countries. And in, in Detroit, they were making, you know, Bonnevilles and, you know, two miles to the gallon cars. And the question of why did Silicon Valley, well, how was it able to move to the next thing and the next thing and Detroit not, I don't think it's a coincidence that Silicon Valley had the highest educated workforce of all urban areas and Detroit had the lowest. And that has proven to be kind of the inoculation to your local economy uh, to, to get those kind of skills. That makes a lot of sense. And actually, Karen, I mean, you're there in the middle of it. How, how has this played out uh, in a company like LinkedIn or, or in some of your, your peers and competitors? Yeah, we're absolutely seeing that in the data that we have. Um, we're getting a real time look at what um, employers are looking for in terms of skills. And they're definitely looking for digital skills. Um, they're, and there are different types of digital skills. You know, there's the disruptive digital skills, which I would say are almost business cycle proof at the moment. Like if you know cloud computing or AI, things like that, you are um, almost you know, Teflon to this, this recession we're going through. Um, and if you have basic digital skills, just basic digital literacy, that that's um, highly sought and almost table stakes for any role. So at this stage, I would say almost any role that um, employers are looking to fill, they're expecting a minimum level of digital fluency and literacy. Um, which means people need to have that. And you know, the way I, I think about it is probably not any different than Austin, you or, or, or Jamie, you're thinking about it. But um, I think, you know, employers are also looking for human skills. Um, and we're seeing a massive growth in demand in the job postings that we are getting for human skills, for collaboration, for having difficult conversations, um, for problem solving and leadership. And so, where I come out on this um, is that uh, machines are definitely here to stay. They are definitely going to replace a lot of work that is either repetitive or unsafe or frankly, not creative. Um, but humans are inherently creative. They're intuitive, they're empathetic. Um, and humans like other humans. Um, they wanna, you wanna get your hair cut by a human, right? Not a machine. So I do think there's opportunity so far as we can train and educate our workforce um, to, to use machines as complements to whatever they're trying to do and to let the humans continue to be the ones that solve the tough, intuitive problems or identify the problems that machines need to solve and let machines do the computational work. Because that's really all that's happening right now with, with machine learning or AI. So they're just problem solving that's set by humans. So I'm on the more optimistic side of this, and I'll tell you, 83% of the jobs that got posted over the summer during this sort of mini boom that we saw in the recovery, um, you know, were were things like looking for all the skills I mentioned: um, digital literacy, data science, data storage, 
collaboration, telemedicine, online teaching. It's all that mix of virtual, uh, virtual, digital, and human skills. So I think the trick is finding a way to let all the humans in our, our society, you know, have the grasp to master what they need in order to use machines to complement them and not let the machines become a substitute for their work. Exactly right. Because at the end of the day for humans, work matters. That That's the issue that fundamentally distinguishes us from the machines at, at the end of the day. Okay, here's the uh, here's the closing question here then. Here's the, the exclamation point on all this. So you're both renowned economists, but um, I give you a magic wand and I say there's one thing you can do to improve the human condition as it relates to work. What is it and why from your perspective? Actually, Karen, why don't you start? Sure. Um... If I could, if I could wave my wand, um, I would reduce the barriers to entry that make the labor market a little bit opaque, especially for people who might be first generation um, or new to the labor market. And by that, I mean um, our own data show us that you know very quickly that if where you grew up, the zip code you grew up in, the school you went to, um, and maybe whether or not you worked at what's considered sort of a top company. All of that gives you a, like almost a 10 times advantage in accessing opportunity. So if I could wave my wand, I would do away with that, what we call the network gap. And I would lower the barriers to entry for people to access opportunity. I would make it not a function of the zip code you grew up in, not a function of whether you went to an Ivy League school and just have it be based on your actual assessment of your skills and not these signals that I think are somewhat indirect. Uh, that would be a, a very big change from from what we have today. All right, Austin, you're going to get the final word here. What, what would you do? Okay, that I thought that was a great one. Let's make it up. It cut a little close to home, that thing about the needing a human Sorry. to cut your hair. Jamie and I were like, whoa, <laughs> wait a second. I, all I need is a machine. I mean, but uh, if I could raise a magic wand, I mean, I thought Karen's was, at, was perfect, but I, I guess I would wave a magic wand and get everybody one if everybody got one extra year of educational attainment or skills attainment, I, I actually think the impact of that on both those individuals, their families and their careers, as well as the broader society would be extremely positive. If you just back at the envelope, add up the how much more likely are you to get a job if you have one extra year of educational attainment? How much more does that year of attainment earn you in higher earnings for the rest of your life, it it adds up into the trillions. So I kind of think that that space that there are currently big inequalities and barriers to some people to to complete or to get these to get these kinds of skills is goes absolutely hand in hand with this idea that we can have shared prosperity. If you look outside the US, there are models or within the US at the different states, there are models that have been successful and we should absolutely pursue those models. I feel kind of about skills and education the same way I feel about COVID, which is there are places that they figured it out. Yes, it would be great to have a vaccine, but until we get a vaccine, let's at least follow some of the best practices and, and we can get some things under control. And that, that same is true about education. We don't need a magic wand. We know a bunch of things that can work. And I think I would add to what you both said, at the end of the day, the thing you want is you want a credential that shows, a degree, a certificate, a certification that shows that you have those skills, that you have that knowledge and ability I think that would make a, a tremendous uh, difference for individuals and for society at large. Karen, Austin, thank you very much for joining me. This has been a terrific conversation. Thank you. Uh, next year in person. Jamie, that was a terrific conversation. And Absolutely, next year in person. So many key points. Uh, I want to go a bit deeper around the equity conversation, particularly given where we are with racial reckoning in this country at this point. Talk to me about how human work 
improves uh, racial equity and, and justice, if you will. Yeah, I hope the book is a wake up call. It's a wake up call first about work itself, right? Because obviously the nature of work is changing and how human work actually plays out those human traits and abilities is really, really important to us. How we are distinguished from what the machines can do and what the humans do is really important. But who is working is also changing. And that's the other part of the human work story that I think is really important. So it's what we're doing and who's doing the work that is key to this human work story. And here I think human work advances justice and equity because everybody has to have a chance to learn and to earn and to serve others. And that's critical to this work around um, what human work is all about. I mean, if you look at uh, what's happened in 2020 and COVID's disproportionate impact on black, indigenous and people of color and essential workers, it really underscores why this is so critical. We have to actually develop the human workers recognizing that racial justice and racial racial injustice and racial inequity are a part of the system. So, you know, at the end of the day, I think these crises might not have been nearly as calamitous if we had approached them with more critical thinking and more compassion and more empathy. And particularly if we had focused that critical thinking and compassion and empathy on the people who've been most impacted in this uh, extraordinary time period, the essential workers who are overwhelmingly people of color, who face not only bias in terms of work, but also in terms of learning and in terms of their pathway through work and life. Very good points, absolutely. I know here in Louisiana, across the country, we're seeing women minorities most impacted by COVID. So I appreciate uh, that point. Uh, before I ask you the next question, I do want to pitch uh, for people to participate in the conversation with us to engage. Uh, there is a chat feature, so we encourage you to put your question in the chat. We ask that you add your name, title, and organization, and we're going to get to as many questions as we can before we wrap up today. Uh, before we do that, Jamie, go to the chat function. I'm curious, given such a robust conversation with Austin and Karen, What's the key takeaway for the audience? Yeah, you're right. There were so many things in that conversation. Like I said, I could have just stepped aside and let them talk for 15 or 20 minutes and it would have been terrific. So in addition to this conversation about inequity and injustice, I think a key point to underscore in that conversation with them was that this race between skills and technology, it's always been present, but it's been accelerated by what we've seen in 2020 with COVID, with the issues surrounding the awakening around racial uh, injustice and inequity and how we have to prepare human workers proactively um, in this environment, I think is a key takeaway for me because technology is going to advance as both Karen and Austin pointed out, that's inevitable, it's inexorable, but we have to make sure that we continue to advance the skills to keep up with the technology. And here, those skills will have to be increasingly the human work skills developing those human traits, the empathy, the ethics, the compassion, the collaboration, the communication, the analytic abilities. Those are the things that are going to be most important. And to me, that was a key takeaway in this conversation about the race between skills and technology. That's a great point. So I'm going to look here at the chat. I think we have our first question. Uh, the question, Jamie, says uh, you raised some very important points about active citizenship revitalizing democracy, thwarting authoritarianism. This was in your conversation with Francisco. Um, tell us a bit more about your thinking around those themes in the book. Yeah, so, you know, this is a, a complex um, area, but I think it's really important to understand the relationship between thwarting authoritarianism, advancing democracy and human work. You know, if you think about the environment that we're in right now around the world in many nations, uh, what we are facing is threats of authoritarianism. Authoritarianism really prefers conformity. It stokes fear, fear of change, fear of difference, fear of the other. That's what authoritarianism is all about. These to me are threats to democracy and to things like the, the diversity of ideas and frankly, the ways of living that democracy is designed to protect. So to me, what happens is that in times of crises like what we're in now, people lose opportunity or never have it, they are uh, compelled by authoritarianism. They like the idea that you can blame someone else. Someone else. They like the idea 
that they should be, uh, that, that fear is a part of what will motivate the change that's necessary. In fact, we've all read these stories about false information during COVID. That false information has overwhelmingly impacted people with lower levels of education. That's the connection, I think, between developing a greater understanding about preparing human workers and what's hap what happens in, in periods of rising authoritarianisms. <clears throat> authoritarianism. We know that college graduates uh, are more likely to vote. They're more likely to volunteer. They're more likely to contribute to charity. But we also know that college graduates are most likely uh, to uh, resist these ideas about authoritarianism and about so-called strong leaders. There's a survey called the World Values Survey, and it, it interviews people around the world about a variety of topics. And one of them is these questions about leadership, having strong leaders and military rule. Um, and in the World Values Survey, they, they ask Americans, as well as people around the world, whether or not then, this is the question, would military rule be good for uh, my country? In the United States, a quarter of the people who have a high school credential or less say yes. People with college degrees, people with post-secondary learning is in the low single digits. So being educated, being able to develop yourself as a human worker gives you the tools to be able to cultivate sort of critical thinking. To, to make ethical decisions and to enhance all of these other democracy uh, traits and capabilities in a lot more people. So at the end of the day, I think we need to engage in active citizenship in this idea of a free expression of ideas. And human work offers us that opportunity. It offers us the opportunity for meaning and purpose, a chance for individual and shared prosperity that uh, just isn't possible in environments where authoritarianism rules. So to me, the connection between human work and thwarting authoritarianism and advancing democracy are tightly intertwined and very important to our future as human workers. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, you have a second question here from Andy Hightower. He says, Francisco mentioned that critical skills, empathy, problem solving were necessarily established uh, prior to higher education, then agreed with Jamie on the uh, on the cruciality of hu of higher education for their development. His question is: If these skills are formed prior to higher ed or need to be, what role does higher ed play? Yeah, I think those human traits and capabilities can be developed and must be developed not only before higher ed but during higher ed and throughout. Again, this is a virtuous cycle of learning and earning and serving. And to me, those critical thinking, problem solving skills, those, those higher order abilities that enhance our human traits. You know, being ethical is something that you learn and that you continue to develop and, and, and promote over the course of your lifetime. Being empathetic is not something that you just possess, you develop it. You can learn to be more empathetic. You can learn to be more compassionate. Um, so all of these human traits and abilities are not just things that are innate, they are things that you can develop. And to me, certainly you can come to the table with some of them before you get to higher education, but higher education and what you do in work can enhance uh, those human traits and capabilities. That's what human work is all about. Thank you, and certainly uh, in critical role for higher education, as you stated. Uh, the third question, Jamie, from Bob Hansen. He says, so much energy around the future of work or human work in the future, to use Jamie's reformulation, is related to technology. How do we get beyond technology to creating analytical thinkers, educated citizens, great communicators, and collaborators? This has long been the role of universities, but less so when it comes to today's learners. Yeah, you know, I think the answer isn't to put technology in one bucket and human workers in the other. I think that's the fallacy of, of the argument, though I certainly believe that uh, technology can, can uh, create barriers. At the end of the day, the technology will advance. Karen K Kimbrough made this point, right, that technology will continue to evolve and change and improve. And the machines, which can focus on speed, uh, machines which have the capacity to do, use algorithms to do deep learning, to be able to learn uh, uh, at, a, at a further level by understanding repetition and patterns, that will happen. Human workers need to develop these human traits and abilities. And I think being able to develop those human traits and abilities means that 
We need to work with the machines, uh, help them do what they are better at humans in doing and prepare our human traits and, and capabilities in ways that advance us. Uh, one way to do that is in higher education, but we can do that at home. We can do that in our workplaces. We can do that in community-based organizations, in libraries, in lots of different ways that go beyond what we would call the traditional bounds of learning in one phase of your life and earning or working in another phase. To me, these things need to come together. Learning and earning and serving others, that's human work. That's the future of human work. And I think we need to go about it together as a society, not entrust simply one actor in society to, to make that happen. Thank you, Jamie. This this hour has gone by so quickly and certainly so much more to discuss, but I want to hand over to you the final question and I want to replicate the question that you asked the economist. You have the magic wand. You have one thing that you can do to improve the human condition as it relates to work. What would it be? I knew this would come back on me, so uh, so let, I'll give you my shot on this, Kim. Um, right. Look, first I want to say human work is already here, so I don't need a, a, a wand uh, to make human work happen. So I'll keep the wand in my hand for now um, and not say I want to use the wand to make human work a reality. Uh, part of me is tempted to say that you know there are these existential threats, things like climate change and what I mentioned earlier, authoritarianism. And I'm tempted to say I would use my wand uh, to actually um, um, end those existential threats. But the human condition ultimately is going to be judged by how we treat each other. And to me, I think, uh, Kim, the human work ecosystem ultimately requires equity and justice. Um, if equity is about eliminating differences, in other words, differences that exist by race and ethnicity, eliminating the outcomes, and if justice is about you know, eradicating the policies and the practices and the systems that allow inequity to, to take place, I think I'd use my wand to achieve true equity and true justice for all. A world where everyone has a chance to learn, to earn, and to serve by doing meaningful work. So I'm gonna use my magic wand to make uh, that equitable, just world happen. And what a fantastic world it would be. Thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. I certainly hope everyone has enjoyed the discussion uh, and that there sparked some interest and some ideas as we have had this conversation today. Jamie, I wonder if there's any other final thoughts from you. Only to thank you again, Kim, and to thank my Lumina colleagues, the board, the staff, all of the people behind the scenes that have allowed me, as I said at the beginning, to get to this day, the launch day, to get this book out and to begin the conversations about how we can make this human work ecosystem a reality. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jamie. Well, this concludes the virtual book launch. Uh, for additional information on human work in the age of smart machines, please visit jamiemarisotis.com and feel free to keep the conversation going using the hashtag human work on social media. Also, this uh, program will be posted on the Lumina website if you want to go back and take a look or you want to hear some more about some of the discussion today or share it with some of your colleagues. Jamie, I know you wanted this book to spark ideas and conversations, and today I think we have done just that. And I want to thank you and congratulate you, Jamie, on this book. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Have a great afternoon.